Hey there, this video is going to be a rough one. Content warning for genocide for the whole duration of the video. I think that for interpersonal conversations, it's very important to adopt certain rhetorical approaches to make people feel like they're understood and to address their concerns. I also feel like we're on the precipice of a genocide. And I know looking at history that your uh, approach has been ineffective. It's so cringe, dude. Would you have told the Jews back in 32 in Germany? Can somebody tweet? Can, I, can, you guys need to do better repping me on Twitter because watch this is all the time. I'll donate $25,000 to any LGBTQIA, whatever fuck plus plus two spirit organization that he wants if there is a genocide against LGBT people in the next five years. Okay, so this is a pretty big claim, right? We're on, We're on the, the precipice, precipice of a genocide. Of a genocide? That's not something to be taken lightly. And if you ask the kind of people who already don't tend to have the fondest opinion of trans people, it's obviously an absurd thing to say. <laughs> what? I, what do you mean by that, Vouch? Vouch, I'm gonna need you to, I'm gonna need you to clarify a little bit, buddy, because you sound a little bit fucking unhinged right now. But the weird thing is, if you ask like experts on genocide, then they all seem to be saying the same thing. So let's talk about that. By now, I've made a bunch of videos about the value of linguistic descriptivism. That is, words are defined by their popular usage rather than by an authority or institution like the dictionary. But genocide, although its popular definition can be broad, is a crime. So it has a legal definition, and I think that's about as good a place to start as any. Genocide was first criminalized internationally by the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Quoting the treaty directly, Article 2. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. As such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, the first thing we need to address is that LGBTQ people are not a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And that basically means that under current international law, it's impossible to commit genocide against people who are joined by gender or sexual orientation. But that's kind of an absurd notion, right? LGBTQ people have been part of broader genocides, namely in Nazi Germany. Plus, gender and sexual orientation are both immutable characteristics, just like nationality, ethnicity, or race. In fact, religion is not an immutable characteristic. I've made this point before, that laws need to be specific, which often means that 70 years removed, the language may be imperfect or incomplete. It doesn't really matter why you're a part of the group you're a part of when someone intends to destroy that group in whole or in part. So in the name of good faith, let's just add an asterisk here. There's no good reason that the legal definition of genocide shouldn't include LGBTQ people. So looking at our definition from the UN, yeah, this does seem a bit extreme. On a systemic level, no, transgender and queer people are not being killed. But that's only one of five conditions of a genocide. And I think there's a fair argument to be made that some conditions are already being met, but that's not even the claim. The claim we see is that we are building up to a genocide, which I would argue is a lot harder to dispute. One document that keeps coming up in the conversation surrounding an impending genocide is Dr. William H. Stanton's 10 Stages of Genocide from 1996. Stanton currently leads Genocide Watch, a nonprofit dedicated to watching out for genocides. And yes, we are going to talk about all 10 stages as laid out by Dr. Stanton. And yes, I think it's going to be awfully dry to just discuss each stage one by one. So I thought... What if Tom Jones sang a song about the 10 stages of genocide? Well, it might go a little something like this. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Setting up that bit is as far as I'm going to take it. This, this video isn't going to be funny. Stage 1. Classification. The first stage is classification, which is pretty self-explanatory. 
A group is classified as distinct from the in-group, and realistically this step is inevitable in any society. But it can only lead to genocide if the segregation is extreme enough. And importantly, this document, The Ten Stages of Genocide, isn't just meant to identify genocides, but to prevent them. To prevent genocide at this stage, Dr. Stanton suggests that societies need opportunities for people of different backgrounds to live and work together. The example he gives for the United States is our public school system. Students of all backgrounds, national, ethnic, racial, religious, and even LGBTQ, work together within our school system, which means that these diverse backgrounds are humanized for the students. But the anti-LGBTQ folks are specifically trying to take that benefit away from queer and trans students, creating an even wider divide between the in-group and the out-group. For queer and transgender people, we have absolutely experienced and continue to experience the first stage. And before you say, well that doesn't mean we're in a genocide, yeah, duh. It's the first stage. Keep up. Stage 2. Symbolization We give names or other symbols to the classifications from stage 1. Classification and symbolization are universally human and do not necessarily lead to genocide unless they lead to the stage of dehumanization. We'll get to that. Stage 3. Discrimination The third stage is discrimination, in which a dominant group uses law, custom, and political power to deny the rights of other groups. So we're definitely seeing this. Over the past several years, we've seen plenty of bills introduced to ban transgender people from sports or public restrooms, which, like, that's obviously very bad and clearly fits into the stage of discrimination since it is an explicit effort to keep transgender people from participating in public life, but we're also seeing efforts to prevent transgender people from even getting to be transgender. Medical transition isn't a necessity for all trans people, but it is widely recognized as medically legitimate and in many cases life-saving. And yet Arkansas, Florida, Texas, and Alabama have all taken legal steps to prevent minors from accessing gender-affirming care. In fact, Alabama's law also applies to 18-year-olds, legal adults. And you might think that's not super unusual. 18-year-olds aren't even that mature, but Alabama's age of consent for sex is 16. So, like, a 70-year-old doctor could have sex with a 16-year-old child, but they couldn't prescribe life-saving hormones to an 18-year-old adult. And, of course, because the United States is a healthcare dystopia, if you have Medicaid in 9 of the 50 states, you're just out of luck. No coverage for gender-affirming care. And, you know, in the recent Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, Justice Clarence Thomas explicitly suggested revisiting Lawrence v. Texas 2003 and Obergefell v. Hodge 2015, which protect queer people's rights to have sex and to get married. And last month, eight Republicans in Congress introduced an act which aims to prevent transgender children from socially transitioning, that is, using their preferred name and pronouns, without their parents' consent. And this isn't likely to pass, but it's definitely a sign of the times that Republicans are trying to make it more difficult for transgender children to exist, not just at the state level, but now federally. So we're likely to see the discrimination stage persist for the foreseeable future. Stage 4. Dehumanization Dehumanization is when one group treats another group as second-class citizens. Members of a persecuted group may be compared with animals, parasites, insects, or diseases. And also spread among the kids themselves. It's, it's, it's a full-on social contagion unlike any that we've seen in our lifetimes. When a group of people is thought of as less than human, it is easier for the group in control to murder them. Consider recently when a sitting member of Congress loudly and deliberately denied that transgender people exist. Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist. I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so get you pregnant. are denying that trans people exist? Thank and that leads. According to Dr. Stanton, the dehumanization stage is all about hateful propaganda. Consider today how quickly the term groomer has become a fashionable way for right wingers to slander LGBTQ people. And I will also go on to say that I believe the LGBTQ community is now dominated by overt pedophiles. 
Like I said, for each stage, Dr. Stanton makes recommendations to prevent a genocide, and this stage of prevention may be the hardest to undertake in the United States. This stage is entirely about hate speech, so Stanton's prescription is to outlaw hate speech. But the right has weaponized big tech censorship to the degree that outlawing hate speech may be politically impossible. And since there is no broad legal threat to hate speech, I'm not sure we're going to stop here. Stage 5. Organization. Genocide is always organized, usually by the state, though sometimes informally or by terrorist groups. Special army units or militias are often trained and armed. Remember earlier this year when a group of Proud Boys interrupted a drag queen story hour and harassed this person for the crime of reading stories in makeup and a dress around children? And like, we need to make that abundantly clear. The problem here is that someone who has a penis happens to be wearing makeup while educating children. I also do that sometimes. Dr. Stanton says that membership in these militias should be outlawed, and the movements of their leaders should be limited. But realistically, that can only go so far when organization, as Dr. Stanton mentions, can be informal. Like in Vinton, Iowa, where enough concerned citizens complained so much about a library having LGBTQ books and staff members that all the full-time staff resigned and the library closed indefinitely. Let me reiterate, a small town forced its own library to close because they didn't want queer people working there. But it's not just militias and ordinary citizens organizing. The political class is also beginning to organize. The Texas Republican Party recently released their platform for the current election cycle, and it includes such legislative gems as homosexuality is an abnormal lifestyle choice, and we oppose all efforts to validate transgender identity. Real quick, just replace that word with any other group identifier and see how it feels. We oppose all efforts to validate Hispanic identity. We oppose all efforts to validate conservative identity. We oppose all efforts to validate Jewish identity. Doesn't feel great, does it? And they're not happy stopping at denying life-saving medicine to kids. No, no, if the major conservative party in one of the largest states had their way, any transgender person up to 21 could not access any gender-affirming care. And if these freaking ghouls had their way, conversion therapy, which in many jurisdictions is legally recognized as torture, conversion therapy would be legal for LGBTQ people of any age. They want to make it legal to torture children and force them to be straight. I don't know, kind of sounds like grooming to me. Stage 6. Polarization. Arguably, we are only up to stage 5 of a genocide, so I'm just going to run through the final five stages. They get more self-explanatory as we go. Polarization. Extremists drive the groups apart. Laws may forbid intermarriage or social interaction between the groups. Extremist terrorism targets moderates and intimidates them so that they are silent. Stage 7. Preparation. National or perpetrator group leaders plan the final solution to the targeted group question, that is, the trans question. They often use euphemisms to cloak their intentions, such as referring to their goals as ethnic cleansing, purification, or counterterrorism. They build armies, buy weapons, and train their troops and militias. Stage 8. Persecution. Victims are identified and separated out because of their identity. Death lists are drawn up. Sometimes they are even segregated into ghettos, deported into concentration camps, or confined to a famine-struck region and starved. Stage 9. Extermination. Extermination begins and quickly becomes the mass killing legally called genocide. Stage 10. Denial. The final stage is denial. Here's the thing about claiming that we're headed toward a genocide. I don't want to be making this claim. I have what a psychiatrist once described as severe OCD, so I tend to catastrophize everything. But I don't know, sometimes I'm right? Like, I was really scared of this weird new coronavirus in January of 2020, and a couple months later it changed everything. 
changes fast, and even when it doesn't, it still changes. Think about how in November 2016, we were all freaking out about Roe v. Wade being overturned, and it didn't happen for five and a half years, but it did happen. I don't want to be making videos about genocide. When people ask what video I'm working on, I want to tell them I'm writing a video about how Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge was a genderqueer masterpiece, or one about how Encanto was secretly a revolutionary communist film. But as hard as it is to write about the genocide of my queer and transgender siblings, it's a lot harder not to write about it. I want to wrap this video up by reminding the viewers that Dr. Stanton isn't some prophet, and he's not the only authority on genocide. He's just an academic, and we all know the ideas of academics can be imperfect. I knew bloody well what was going to happen. I knew that this pronoun nonsense would produce a psychogenic epidemic of gender dysphoria, mostly affecting young women, and that the consequence of that would be that thousands of young people would be sacrificed to hypothetically save a tiny minority of people, and with, who aren't being saved in any case. But the thing I find most useful about Dr. Stanton's work is the notion that genocide doesn't start at the end. It starts slowly, with classification and symbolization, things that could go relatively unnoticed in any society. And through a long, gradual process over several years or even decades, stages like discrimination and dehumanization become normalized. And we've still got a few stages to go before we get to the mass killings, but if we wait for that, it's going to be too late.